Hello and welcome to the Armin Show podcast. Science, creativity, people, learning more. The connections are building. It is very cool. On this episode here, we have an individual that puts things together quite well, I must say, among various other qualities. We have the author of this book right here, The 12 Monotasks. Our guest today, Thatcher Wine. Thatcher, welcome to the show. Thanks, Armin. It's really nice to be here. I'm very glad to have you on. And that theme right there is something I've noticed in even how the book arrived in the packaging, in your content, images, all the material is well presented. It's a clean look. It's a nice feature there. What is getting straight into it? Uh, and then I'll go back to a backstory. What is one of the themes or what are the themes you want to present to people in all your efforts? That's a really great question. Yeah. I don't know if ever, anyone's ever like really stepped back and asked me the, you know, the thousand foot view, um, how it all goes together. <laughs> From far away. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to do things at a really high level, really creative, beautifully designed and fully present, like in the real world with my full attention. And, you know, hopefully like the things I write and the things that we create at Juniper Books, which is my business, you know, get people's attention and encourage them to like pay attention themselves to the things that are important in their lives. So that's kind of what ties it all together. That's cool. I can see that and sense it. It is wonderful and colorful, including the cover of the book. Now, a variety of topics here, but one first is, I'll do a quick summary actually for individuals there. I always think about the listeners here. You are a successful entrepreneur, dedicated father and cancer survivor, not light item there. Founder and CEO of Juniper Books that you mentioned there, company that specializes in curating libraries and designing special edition book sets, co-author of For the Love of Books, designing and curating a home library, and your work has been featured in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and CBS Sunday Morning, a variety of locations. Now, Juniper Books is, how cool is that to create your own book emporium, if you will? How did you end up creating Juniper Books, and how is it going currently? Uh, it's going great, better than, than ever. And I started 21 years ago, so it's been a little while. Um, and I, and it's, I think maybe one of the reasons it's going so well is that I never intended to create a business <laughs> out of it. It was a hobby. I turned it into a business over the years. I love books, love collecting books. I love design, um, love interior design in particular. And, you know, I started selling rare books Back in 2001, I'd come out of the tech business. I'd been, I'd started an online customer service company before that, done some internet consulting for other people. And I was kind of burnt out on technology. And this was like way before it was cool to be burnt out on tech, um, before it was a thing, before the iPhone even existed. And I started, know. yeah, it was a while ago, it was 2001. And I started selling books as a hobby, you know, just going to estate sales and antique auctions and putting them on eBay. One thing led to another. I was buying out bookstores. I was, you know, somebody said, I've got 25,000 dusty books in a warehouse. I was like, I'll take it. Um, and just had a lot of fun researching the books, telling the story of the books. And eventually people asked me to curate their home libraries and collections and rare book things they were working on. And then I added on the custom book jackets, which can transform your, your books and what they look like, kind of turn your shelves into artwork and really help you tell the story of who you are on your bookshelves. So just kind of gone with it as, as we've evolved. We've got about 22 employees these days and we ship all around the world. And, and then I also write books. Um, so it's, it's super fun. I love it. It's sort of a couple dream careers tied together. This is a great thing and very fitting for the current time when some of the most notable book sharing people on online media it's about not just the book, but actually the presentation, the look, how it's placed. It's a big mm -hmm. deal. And sometimes a book that is better displayed is shared a hundred times more than another book that would be in the back corner of some library or somewhere because it doesn't have the, there's something nice about the imagery that is pleasant to individuals. Mm -hmm. And we're in a time of more uh, individuals wanting something to be pleasant or emotionally fulfilling in some way. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a emotional psychological component to it and, and there's, 
the way you reach a lot of people on that these days is the visual aspect of it, um, you know, to be honest. And I think right. you just have to be realistic. And I came to that conclusion a long time ago. And, and at first people were like, you know, are you just selling books by their cover? Um, <laughs> the old saying. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the cover is important. How, you know, if you, you know, I have books behind me now. I, I don't know where your books are, but right. I'm sure there's, there's somewhere <laughs> nearby. Um, but it's like, however many books you have, if you were reading them, you could only read one book at a time. But we keep all these other books. Why do we keep them? Like, maybe we'll read them. We kind of want to show other people what we're interested in. Maybe somebody comes over and they say, oh, I didn't know you were interested in that. I love that book or that author, or that subject. Like, anyway, books serve a lot of other purposes. And the way we communicate that is visually, like the book is an object when you're not reading it. So it should look good. And when you put a bunch of books together, like they can tell a bigger story and kind of cue people what you're interested in. And with like Zoom calls and all that, like that's what's been going on the past couple of years. Like people put certain books behind them so that people know a little bit more about who they are and what they want to talk about and what they're interested in. And I think that's a good thing. This is true. Some of the discussions I've had, I've always, I always tend to focus on the bookshelf behind <laughs> individuals. Yeah. It's something great. It's like a depth of experience represented in visual form. It says a lot and you don't need to say it. It's right there. And it's exactly. kind of representative. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes colorful. I always look at the colors in front of books. The I, I even look at the chapter layout and the mm -hmm. sections and I look at a lot of details of books. So I, I see the value in such category and the relevance of that. What were, were there any, if you had to think of any difficult moments in Juniper books history, are there any that come to mind where suddenly it was like, oh, this thing, or we left this out, anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, any entrepreneurial journey, there, it's not all in a straight line, right? So there are a lot of ups and downs. Um, you know, some of them relate to just like business cycles or, um, you know, competitive issues you know, a lot of like my downs kind of corresponded to some of the things that I was going through, which you mentioned in your introduction. Um, so a few years ago, um, I had cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and went through pretty hardcore chemotherapy. Was still trying to like run the business and be, you know, brave and resilient and, and try to have as much energy as possible to run the business, but it was tough. And then I, I got divorced pretty soon after that and um, was trying to be a good parent and was just, you know, basically distracted. And that's what, when I came up with a lot of the ideas for writing the 12 monotasks and the whole monotasking philosophy. And, you know, but it's when you're, we were much smaller then, um, but I still wanted to be creative. I still wanted to be successful and profitable. Um, but could I like really be fully present for every single customer and every employee conversation and meeting. No, it was, it was a real challenge. Um, and that took a toll and it took some time to put back together. We have to be present for those times or else they get detracted from, and we're the only one who has a full sense of where we could be and where we're at currently because of something until it returns to that yeah. time frame. We also like, we tend to be pretty hard on ourselves. Like, especially if you are a you know, high achiever, and then you can't do it for a little while for some reason, um, whether it's your health or just distractions or, you know, you have too many things going on. Um, so I think we have to, everybody told me back then, like, slow down, like, take, you know, get some rest. And I was like, no, no, I can do it. I can do it. Um, but I wish I had listened <laughs> better because it probably took me longer to recover. Um, but we, you know, so I think we just have to give ourselves time to rest and recover and nourish ourselves because this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Um, that's important to keep in mind. The long-term view. Yep. Or loses. The short-term view may, may have difficulties there. That's true. Now, speaking of monotasking, focusing on one item, the book, which is super colorful. I have to point this out again. Look at all the cool colors, everybody. And the... <laughs> message of it is to do one thing at a time to do everything better. Is this related to any of the concepts of minimalism or huge hour, uh, many hours of focused effort on one thing? How would you describe monotasking? Um, I think it can be related. Um, it's also related to things like mindfulness. Um, but I decided to use very like secular terminology. I didn't want people to feel like this is a spiritual practice if they're not into that. This is about being present, you know, 
in the present moment and doing one thing at a time to do everything better. Just like the subtitle says, it's like bringing some awareness to the fact that like, oh, I'm, I might, I'm habitually multitasking. Be, you know, our phones have a lot to do with it. Our screens, you know, I could be doing, trying to do an email and having conversations with my kids and thinking about what I'm making for lunch. Like, that's just what we've been taught to do. Like, we shouldn't feel bad about it at all. And our phones are just constantly like, look at this, look at that. You know, and you're good at it. Like you can open these apps and respond to this notification. But the reality is like, we don't, we get more done if we do one thing at a time. It may, you're not going to look as busy because <laughs> you're going to look like you're focused. And you're only doing one thing. Unbelievable. Right. It's like, you know, how could you dare do that? Like when you could be folding laundry and cooking dinner while, you know, having a Zoom call, why, why should you just have a Zoom call? But, you know, you'll do better work the studies show if you focus on one thing at a time, you'll get more done in the long run and you'll be less stressed out. There's a study that shows that it takes us on average 23 minutes to switch from one task to another, like and fully get into it, like cognitively figure out where were we, what's the context, you know, where did I leave off on what I was doing, you know? So like, if it takes us 23 minutes to kind of like reset our brains and go from like, a call with a customer to a presentation to a different client. Like we shouldn't try to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth all the time. We're just doing bad work and stressing ourselves out. So you should, you know, finish what you're doing, take a break for 20 minutes, go for a walk, go make a snack, go take a nap, whatever, and then do a good job on the next thing. So that's what the book is really about. This is a highly valuable one for anyone listening such that spending a good section of time on one thing outdoes spending five times that time on 14 mm -hmm. different things because the level on each of these 14 different things is so low it's almost like you're barely traversing through them versus actually contributing your value as a person so those are a zero in actual value terms and then this one is something that a day later a week later i did that or i figured out that it's a it's like a base for your next step the difference mm -hmm. is pretty strong that's cool. Now, in the first chapter, we talk about reading, which is something I do quite a bit. And I also like how you use the computer analogy, like it has RAM and computers are good at multitasking with their switching ability, but still they end up actually focusing on one item and then they, they do the cycles item. But, and I like they mentioned RAM and such. Any, any representation of random access memory and things from 1990s is golden <laughs> to me. Um, in reading, I like that you brought up that the pages physically there make a difference in books. And I read a lot. Uh, if someone is focusing on a book, sh should they be reading the book in two goes? Should they be somebody recommended reading p potentially as like each chapter is like a blog post, but it's, it's their own each. How can someone take a good amount from a book and uh, not end up skipping, uh, stopping after three chapters? Well, I mean, I think, the experience of reading is very personal. There's no correct way to read. And the more experience you have reading, um, kind of the easier it comes. And so you, you might read a book on one setting, sitting. Um, other people, you know, might get completely bored and distracted and not be able to sit there for more than five minutes. Some people, you know, I have, you have to be realistic these days. Like most people don't read books. <laughs> Um, it's the reality. I mean, I'm not, you know, living on a different planet. Um, we're very successful in the book business, but it's, you know, and it's all about printed books, not eBooks. Um, but you have to kind of meet people where they're at. So what I say is, you know, do something every day that helps build your attention span. I like to read books. I find that that's the best way for me to strengthen my attention span, my ability to get more work done be present in conversations with people I care about and, um, you know, ignore or just like not succumb to distractions like that are happening all the time around us, thanks to our phone and just how distracting the world is, the news, everything. So if that, so for me, that basically means reading for at least 20 minutes a day. That probably just equates to, you know, one to three chapters of whatever I'm reading. Um, for other people, they, they might be faster readers or they, you know, they might just read like a newspaper article. That's totally fine. So I think the more you practice you have at it, 
and you start where you're at, like just try to build upon that. So maybe it's 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night, and you go from there. That's a good one right there. Does any of your concepts related to this focus come from a relation to like uh, Deep Work or Cal Newport or mm -hmm. uh, Scott Young, any of those individuals that they really focus on something for a while? Yeah, Cal Newport is very influential um, on my book and, and how I work um, just as an entrepreneur and a creative as well. Um, so both Digital Minimalism and Deep Work, especially those two books were, were very pivotal in my thinking. Um, so I think just the, the concept of deep work, even without getting into all the practices about how you do it, like is something that's different from what everything, you know, we're taught in the world and how like almost every office, I don't know how many people are going back to offices at the moment, but how every office is set up to just be like super distracting, like, you know, the open layout everybody's just distracted all the time. Like who, who came up with that? I mean, I can understand <laughs> it, but um, you know, so like when you really need to do important work, you need to do deep work. You need to like not ta switch between tasks um, all the time because you have to recognize like how long it takes to really like get to the point where you can do good quality work. You need to figure out what works for you. I'm wearing headphones. Like I wear these all the time when I work usually with no music playing at all. It's just like a cue to me to like to focus. Um, maybe there's like a psychological benefit too of just you know, blocking out the noise. Um, so you find the things that work for you, the place that works for you, the ergonomics that work for you to do your best work. And, and if you just like have that mindset shift, that's like, I don't have to do what everybody else is doing because they're all sitting at Starbucks and they're productive or they're all sitting in this, you know, 40 person office and they're somehow getting something done. Like I'm going to figure out what works for me and I'm going to recognize the difference between kind of like light work and deep work. Like these things I can check off, you know, yeah, I can have the TV on and send a few emails. That's fine. But this other stuff, like I need an hour at my desk and I'm going to get it done. Well, right. You can always see things by looking at a week ago or a month ago and how did it go? And did I, get some items done that I wrote down in my journal, anything like that? Or did I leave those alone? Do you use any journal applications, by the way, like Notion or Evernote or text? You know, I, I haven't used the applications. I, if you saw my desk right now, you'd see it's all post-it notes. <laughs> That's what I use. Um, I have a few physical journals um, and post-it notes. I, I do have like Google Docs that I just kind of probably use in a similar way to those applications. Um, but I find that, you know, a few different systems that cross the like analog digital divide, you know, do work for me. Hmm. Earlier on in your existence, were there any books that were pivotal in either inspiring your work with books or uh, that made you think, okay, I would like to write one as well. When you come to mind in that category. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always considered myself a writer from, you know, maybe since I graduated from college or so, like I, I was writing screenplays at one point and uh, some of the, the books in that field, like the, I think Robert McKee's book about story uh, was influential and about like the hero's journey and some of like the Joseph Campbell work on that front was also kind of influential and in just understanding, you know, the pattern of how fiction and storytelling really works and why it appeals to the human brain. And, and then, thinking about it in those terms and in terms of like conflict and resolution. Um, and I think that like, to some extent, you know, inspires part of what I do, like with a different medium of just the bookshelf, not just books themselves and what's inside of them. Like, how do you tell a story through design and through, through a medium that I use, you know, for books, um, you know, and, and some of that was influential, I guess, in telling my own personal story, um, in a self-improvement book that's also, you know, has a lot of practical tips about, you know, what can improve people's lives. Just kind of sharing my own experience, like here's what I went through, what I learned, and then, you know, how I'm, what, what, what I can extract from that and share with the world and, and hopefully improve it. There's something great about storytelling. I've seen that a few individuals who are very good at storytelling are able to take items that would have passed by for other individuals, but then for them, they turn it into a representation of a hero's journey. And then it's so much bigger 
because they took the time to put it together as a beginning where it led to difficulties along the way and everybody can relate with it. Whereas if they didn't do that, they would still have done those things, but it would not grow into this huge representation. It would just be another individual and their time that passed by. The difference is huge. Yeah. And I think like I'm in a writing group and, you know, sometimes I'm better at like giving people feedback on their stories than, you know, figuring out what to do with my own. Um, that's just the way it is. But, you know, a lot of things I always say is like, you know, because people feel the need when they write a story that's like inspired by the truth, like, or whatever, it's a true story, like they, they, they have to include everything. And, you know, a lot of my feedback is always like, you know, okay, write that down once and then like take away, you know, as much as you can until you get to like the story, you know, the bare bones, you know, and then if you've taken away too much, then add some stuff back. But like, and, and some people are like, but then it's not true or something. And it's like, no, it's, it's, you're just telling the story in a different way that really resonates with people. Um, it's not necessarily a different way. It's just what you've, you just said. It's like they, you create the conflict, you figure out like the key elements of the, the hero and the opposition and villain or whatever. And like, there's just something in our human brains that really like understands the story in that pattern. Um, and it's still the same story and it's, it's just more impactful. Um, and whether that's a, like a corporate speech or a best-selling novel, it's, it's similar in how you reach people. It's a great feature. I was just thinking about it. Like if I recorded somebody for 24 hours, like a video of them, that would be every single detail, let's say mm -hmm. with video and audio, but that's not, we see that casually all the time and nobody will really resonate with that because, okay, that's person doing their thing. Or, I mean, they might watch a whole video like that, but the key is the story is like, this is relevant and these are items that we really care about maybe we don't care so much that person drove to there or took the train or they might but we might focus on their internal struggle or a relationship that worked mm -hmm. out or didn't work out how did they deal with it and then where did they end up after passing that oh i can do the same thing there's key elements versus mm -hmm. the routine elements of the day we can we don't need to include all those in a story like that yeah totally you know a lot of times you want to like come into the story either in the middle of it or like towards the end of the scene you know it's like and you your brain knows like or it works a little harder to figure out like what happened what's the context you know but it's much more entertaining than like seeing everything you know right yeah making the brain work is a good thing for challenging. yeah totally yeah that's a lot of what i do yeah <laughs> and then i like it's like an expansion period when you put out all, all the ideas and then consolidation to the main points Mm -hmm. wonderful cycle that we do do you use that same process you had mentioned bookshelf in a design of for someone's books uh like taking in all the ideas they have and then whittling it down to what it could be or how does how does that work yeah to a certain extent um it's you know i'll when we talk to a new client it's you know tell us as much as you want us to want to tell us you know who are your favorite authors your favorite subjects you know what are your ideas for the design and we'll, we'll come up with a few concepts and then the collection when we start putting together the books will kind of expand and then contract and you know i'll always be looking for like what could we take out that's just that stands out as not being relevant um or just the outlier or or maybe if it is the outlier like how do we make that a whole subject category in itself um so it's it's very organic a lot of times i mean some some clients will be like i want the complete works of stephen king and so we just go get the complete works <laughs> of stephen king that's um but if it's like oh i love stephen king and horror and fantasy or whatever then like we'll show some pictures and they'll be like i love this not so into that and we'll kind of evolve it um so it's very organic mm. that's cool another element that was brought up i think henry david thoreau does it or did it walking we do it it's very healthy. And I think a lot of thinkers do it on a regular basis. How does that become a monotask? How might people not be doing that as a monotask when they could be doing it as a monotask? So we tend like, because walking is relatively easy, like we know how to do it. We tend to combine easy tasks in our, in our world with other tasks. We tend to multitask them. So, you know, people go for a walk and they make a phone call or listen to an audio book or take pictures on the walk whether that's multitasking is debatable. Um, 
some people even just look down at their phone, like scroll through social media while they're walking and then trip over stuff. <laughs> um, so the idea of monotasking walking is like, can you monotask your walk? Could you bring the same focus that you take to reading a book to monotasking a walk? where you just go for a walk, you pay attention to like what you're seeing without, you know, succumbing to taking pictures. You don't listen to anything except for the sounds of nature or the city you're in, you know, can you just heighten your awareness of everything and just be like hyper present and focused. You don't have to do it every single time you go for a walk. You could add back, you know, making a phone call or, or doing something else, but can you do it? Like, can you do one thing at a time? And if you can, like, Things like reading, things like walking and other monotasks I'm sure we'll talk about all help you strengthen your ability to focus and pay attention in anything you do. So don't think of going for a walk as like playing hooky from work or, you know, wasted time. It's like you're going to strengthen your attention span so that you, when you come back to your desk, you're going to get more done. This theme was very valuable to me. I don't think there's anything stronger than developing your attention span in this way because when you do it, anytime I've done it with reading any category, if I go back out into the world, it's like I'm a Superman out here because it just puts you in a different space. You can feel it. You're like, oh, okay, I am there. And then other people can feel it too. They automatically are like looking at you as like the person who was able to put their cortex into <laughs> a state for a bit. I can't believe this. How have you done such right. a thing? They're not saying it directly, but it feels like that. Yeah. yeah. You ever get yeah, that sense? Yeah, I know everybody else, you know, is like, you know, ping ponging around from, I mean, not to like, you know, stereotype everybody else, but like a lot of people are just like going from TikTok to Instagram to, you know, like your attention is being fragmented by almost everything in our world right now. Like, because people are, you know, the attention economy, people are trying to sell more ads and convince you to use virtual reality in the metaverse and all that. But it's like, the opposite of that is is reading a book or going for a walk and just like strengthening your attention span. And then you could put it to work, like if you work for a tech company, like designing a great game or something, that, that's fine. Um, but you just have to recognize that they're two totally different things and that everything we do in the world today chops up our attention span into like smaller and smaller fragments. And we have to do something to counterbalance that. That's true. It may look like a more uh informative casual book but in fact this book is representing a war of attention that's happening behind <laughs> the scenes yep if we don't compete well in that let's say war then our time which is our most valuable thing gets tossed out and then all we can do is five years later look back and say what was the our oh i was going to say that our biggest memories are the things that we focused on fully and the things we focused on 12 percent. i don't think we remember them Mm -hmm. They just disappear into the abyss of sorts. Not yeah, and yeah, no, and the, like the future is only going to get more distracting, right? You think it's distracting right now, but tech companies and you know everything that's going on right now is just going to be, you know, faster, more distracting, more sophisticated in its ability to just get your attention in the future. So I think we have to like you know, develop what I call our monotasking muscles, our ability to pay attention, to resist distractions and decide for ourselves, what do we want to do? What do we want? You know, what do we need to do? Can we, you know, in any given moment decide like, oh, I'm going to get done what I want to and need to do my work, my family, you know, my partner, all the things that like, you know, matter to me, or, you know, do I want to let myself go? I, you know, watch a movie on Netflix, sit on the couch, you know, text your friends on Snapchat, whatever, like you can decide to do that too, as long as it's your decision. So a lot of it's just about cultivating the ability to have those monotasking muscles to decide whether to monotask or multitask. I would say this to any audience member listening, the value is in the monotasking, not in the 14 things at the same time and looking a certain way, because you're the only one who later on feels I should have focused on one thing. Now, one category that I get from reading but is related in another domain is learning the educational world long live figuring things out a few people i check online they talk about better ways to learn maybe using mnemonics or methods or they look at uh, strategies or ultra learning i want to talk with scott young the book is right there i really should have the books behind me that's a great point now 
what does it take to learn in a focused nature? Is it using note cards, flashcards, uh, putting aside any music? What's the best ways? Um, I, again, it's very personal. So, you know, there are a lot of methods out there and you mentioned some of them. Um, you know, I think at just a, a very fundamental level, doing one thing at a time with your full attention is going to le lead to learning more than multitasking. If you sit in class listening to a lecture while, you know, being on your phone, you're not going to get as much. Like that's just the reality of it. And I think that that most of the younger generation these days, I see with my own teenage kids, like is convinced that they can multitask, that they're not losing information or their ability to learn. And it's, it's a struggle um, to just like develop that awareness that like, oh, maybe I should focus. Um, and then whether you're, I, I think you also have to monotask your assessment of yourself. So you mentioned some great books. Like if you read those books and you're like, oh, this really resonates with me and I'm going to give it a try and it works, great, do it. If you read it and it's like, it seems too hard or it doesn't work for me, like move on. There's 99 other approaches you can take. And if you understand, like, and also don't accept like what you were told as a kid about you're a terrible learner. Like I was told, you know, I was the worst language student in the world when I was in French class. And then I switched to Spanish and the Spanish teacher said I was a language genius. <laughs> which, which one is it? They can't both be true. Pick one people. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, learn, figuring out like how you best learn, changing your own personal story, like about, I am a good student. Like I just didn't figure, I didn't know how to learn when I was in a big public school with, you know, a busy classroom and a teacher that didn't have patience for me. You know, I learn. you know, I don't know what people might decide. Like they might learn best listening to audiobooks. Um, they might be more of a visual learner. They might be more of a kinesthetic learner. Like they need to go do it um, and, you know, develop the muscle memory for it. So I think monotasking can be applied to both how you learn and then also, you know, to figure that out. And then also when you say, I'm going to drop into my learning monotask now and I'm going to pay full attention, you'll, you'd be surprised at what you can learn. The point about avoiding places of friction is key to me. Anytime you feel that with a person, a topic, a subject, something you're working on, you are pushing against the elements. You are pushing against the elements in some way. There's somewhere else that is not that. And so it's not about having this like, oh, I have to just, that's not how we, how we were built for. And then the item of, um, is it going against friction? And then I lost my train of thought. What was the previous item that was mentioned? Um, in my response before about learning. Yes. Um, well, we talked about a whole bunch of different stuff, but I mean, the friction thing, just to stay with that for a second. I mean, yeah, I think it's important to, sometimes the struggle is good. And sometimes the struggle is an indication that you should like find the flow somewhere else. And if we're always multitasking, like we're, we're operating this level of noise where we can't really, we're not really in touch with like how we feel and what we really think. Um, we always like can just kind of exist in like a little bit of a numbness stage. So if you take away the multitask, you take away the distractions, you take away the noise, you can figure out, oh, like I can find a better way to do this with less friction. Um, you know, it's just a completely different approach. I need to read that book or do that seminar or just decide to pay attention. That's true. We don't want those things uh, grinding against us. We find our way. And, oh, I was going to say, I, I might like to uh, be more text-based. I figured that out a long time ago. So I like things mm -hmm. like uh, text on, let's say, Twitter or a PDF or a research okay. paper. And so when I figured that out, suddenly I'm like, okay, that's my, I know somebody who yeah. likes to listen on audiobooks, for example, to all their yeah. books. So they only select that. And we don't want to yeah, leave it alone. Yeah, it's great to figure time. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and for me, I like, I like variety, you know, I, I, things are best on paper for me. Um, I like kind of physically understanding like spatial awareness of like where I'm reading on the page or within the book. And kind of, I remember like where I read that, you know, book or article or something like where I was sitting geographically, what time of day it was and things like that. Like that helps me kind of 
develop some context and, and create the memories. You mentioned that before too. Um, so that, that that's important to me, but there are other times when I just want to chill out, turn off the lights and listen to an audiobook. That's more peaceful. Now, as, as far as spatial representation and seeing things, there's a section on seeing, and I attuned to this because I have always thought about the value that our vision has and that it takes maybe 25 to 30% of our brain resources to keep our vision going. So sometimes in the day I'll have like a period, I'll just close my eyes or on the treadmill at the gym, I'll just walk with my eyes closed hmm. so that it's like when my th eyes are open, it's higher value time. What can we do to focus with our visual time and um, are people just tossing out valuable vision moments of their day? So one thing we can do is just recognize how overstimulated through our eyes we are. So a few decades ago, we saw like 500 advertisements a day on average, like billboards and TV and all that. And, and you could probably tell where most of them were. These days, it's over 10,000 ads that each of us see every day. A lot of them are very subliminal. You don't even know you're seeing an ad, um, whether it's, you know, on, it's mostly on your devices. Um, so I think just recognizing like how much information is coming at us and that we couldn't possibly process all of that. We have to be kind of selective about what we take in um, and give our attention to. So once you do that, then you can start to like slow things down and look at the things that are important and, and then take the breaks that you need if you are in like a super, you know, hyper stimulating environment, um, like Times Square or something. I, I don't recommend closing your eyes there, but, but we probably should. Um, it's just way too much information. And, you know, I think, and then also doing things that strengthen our ability to, you know, visual muscles, as well as our ability to pay attention, like reading we've talked about or going for a walk in nature is, it would be great. It's a little less distracting than the city. Um, and then you can really like pick a focal point. I have an exercise in the book where you like pick a focal point close to you and then one that's, one that's further away from you. Yeah, so you can like try to see things you've never seen before just by like really intensely looking at the horizon or something far away um, versus looking at something up close that maybe you've never looked at up close. I've done, when I, when I saw that, I'm like, I've done that a few times and it's like, I didn't know that building was there or mm -hmm. I didn't know this corner looked like this. It's a mate. We are built to pass things by very often versus yeah. the things we focus on with our cones and rods. I once, I talked about it with a visual person about our cones yeah. and the focus yeah. and the, yeah. the rods are just kind of yeah. lightly I, black I, and white. Yeah. My 13 year old daughter is, is hilarious. Sometimes she's like, you know, we'll drive somewhere that we, we've done the drive like a million times. She's like, did they just put that building in? I'm like, they, like, you don't just put a building in. Like somebody worked on that for like three years. It's been there on every drive. You're just looking at your phone normally. So um, yeah, it's funny. You can see a lot of different things when you really look up. We need an edited video of somehow pre that building and then boom, somebody plopped it in <laughs> next day. Yeah. Installed. Extreme home makeover, commercial <laughs> apartment building edition. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Actually on that one, that's kind of interesting. Um, home makeover, uh, where, this is a returns to uh, Juniper Books, but and you're curating, where are some locations or places that, that may have taken you? Did you go like on the spot to some locations? Has that taken you to any locations? Um, yeah, there are a lot. Um, I mean, we, we ship to about 65 countries every year. Um, it's amazing. You know, it's a niche, what we do in the book world. And, and people find us, which I'm super grateful for. And we do really cool personal, you know, projects for them. Um, some of them are for like hotels and businesses. Um, I just, one of my favorite projects is in New York city and I just found out it's closing. It's the nomad, uh, New York city hotel. Oh, um, I've been to the nomad here in downtown LA. Okay, cool. I didn't do that one, but that, I think that has a library that was inspired by what I did in New York. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, the New York, all those hotels, like, and a lot of hotels these days have libraries, which is great. Um, I mean, we've done probably over a thousand hotel libraries at this point and really help to kind of bring back the popularity of books in the lobby and books in rooms and books, you know, used for both decoration, but also to inspire people to 
maybe slow down and read them, ideally. So those are our most public projects. A lot of them are, are private through, you know, celebrities' homes and, you know, people's apartments and things around the world. Hmm. That is a lot. Over a thousand. Yeah. That's a yeah. It's 21 years, you know, so we, we've, um, you know, done, we've been very productive. Yep. It's super cool to be prolific in a category. And when you mentioned niche, I thought to myself, there is no better thing than being niche at the current moment. Because it's, as a person, you're one person, and when you see things, you're like, oh, that speaks to me. That's all we want. We don't want some broad nature thing that's meant for a, we want something where it's like, oh, it's us, and it's cool, and it might be, we're the ones who figured it out, or something like that. It's a nice feature to niche. Yeah, no, it's a good time for to do something specific and niche for people to be able to find you through the internet. So, I mean, there are, I'm not like all, always anti-tech. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I have a, you know, basically a luxury e-commerce business. So it's great that people can find us and, and order from around the world. Um, the other thing, you know, with regards to monotasking, um, you know, being like, I always say, you know, one of the reasons the cover is colorful of the book, um, looks good is that, you know, my philosophy in life is like, you should do all the things you want to do. You should have a very colorful life. It's not about, I mean, some people might take and be like, I'm going to be a minimalist. We we'd mentioned that before, but not really talked about it. But I think personally, it's like, you can do all the things you want to do in life. You just should do them one at a time. You should give your attention to them. And so having a niche business that's not like trying to be all things to all people is about, you know, focus and figuring out how to make that, you know, the product and services you sell successful. And then like, build on it one thing at a time. Like, okay, now we're going to add on custom jackets or we're going to add on this type of customer and market to them. Um, and then you kind of figure it out and grow it over time and not set out with a business plan that might be overly ambitious and, and get you into a lot of multitasking trouble because you're never really like operating at your highest quality. You just reminded me of one time there was an interview of singer Jewel on... Uh, with Gary Vaynerchuk, and she was describing how all the elements of her life, they had to have tone, something like they were <laughs> all, and so her emotional self and her physical self and her relationship self, if any of them don't have tone, there's a huge gap that will uh, come back to cause problems later on, which is kind of representative of this image. We would think that we can leave out something, and we'll skip it, and we'll get back to it later on, but more like it'll get back to us later on sooner than we get back to it in a way. Yeah, no, I love that. I'll have to look at that interview um, with Jewel. Um, but I think that's even just like understanding how your own brain and your life works. Um, you know, obviously like artists and musicians, we assume that they can be different. They can figure it out, you know, like, but then all of us need to do the same thing. Like you don't have to be an artist or a musician to just like do a little bit of, self-analysis and figure out like, oh, I need, like, I personally, I think of things in terms of like colors and shapes and, and how I balance my life. I think it's like synesthesia or something. Um, I need to look into it some more. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it is. And maybe, I don't know if Jules, you know, tone thing is, is some similar form of that, but just with a different, you know, approach. Anyway, so like just doing that, having that understanding of like what works for you and then being communicative about it. Um, I think it's totally fine. I think we all assume that like everybody works the, the same way and we all have to work the way that you know, big corporations want to sell products to us, but everybody's different. Everybody's unique. And, um, you know, we all want to live a happy, successful life. So we should figure out how to do it. There's a key point there. The last item from the monotasking section is I would want to look at as a creator, fellow creator here, and I have talked to many, obviously, creators. In the category of creation, is it worthwhile for someone to like super monotask such that their world becomes their creation world and everything else can branch off of that? Is that a healthy way to go? Can that work? What are your thoughts on that? I think, you know, I'm somebody who 
has a very creative career. Um, and I'm always creating and I'm sort of fueled by creative ideas and bringing them to life. Um, do I always monotask my creativity? No, I do a mix of, um, you know, focus like deep work when I, you know, have a deadline and let's say, and, and just need to create something for a client or, you know, finishing a chapter of the book. Um, but other times, like, I know I need to go for a bike ride. I need to go on a trip. I need to like do something that gets me out of my head. Um, that then the creative ideas can come in and then I can unlock the, the solutions to a problem I'm, I'm trying to solve. You have to understand the difference between the two. Like if you, if you go to bed, you know, and you're like, I got to solve the problem. I got to, you know, figure out what to do tomorrow. Like, you know, you're going to get crappy sleep and you're probably not going to solve the problem. But if you like monotask your sleep and get a great night's sleep, like the idea might come to you while you're sleeping or, you might wake up refreshed and you figure it out in the morning. Um, so I think having that balance of, of how you, understanding how you create and then kind of like switching gears a little bit um, can really help us be our most creative selves. I like that relaxed form. We don't need to be, the opposite of that might be frantic and I've never seen great things come from a frantic energy it's almost like you're disagreeing with the world that you can do it because you're saying I must to do it. It's almost like you're telling yourself I would not be able to do it in a normal context. So I can't agree with that one. Frantic versus yeah. relaxed. And there's, yeah. And there's like a whole concept of flow that we didn't talk about, but like the most creative people basically, well, not everybody, but like a lot of creative people, you know, in, in high performing athletes, musicians, and like they get into the flow of what they're really good at. And then they just operate there and they don't have to think about what they're doing, like Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods or Mick Jagger or something like they're You just, you want to figure out what your own ability to get into the flow is. Some of that comes from like practice and training and learning. Um, but I think also a lot of it comes from like either choosing to monotask, um, or choosing to multitask, like to, to get your mind off of it and just like go do something else and then the ideas will come to you. Um, so, but just recognizing that there, yeah, there are some states that can make you more creative and more productive. And some of the other ones like frantic, you know, obsessive, obsessive you know, like just, you know, exhausted, like those don't tend to lead to the best ideas. So. That's true. On the topic of your happenings and Juniper books, any um, messages of maybe goals or upcoming uh, items looking to in the next few years, anything that comes to mind in that category? Yeah, so I'm you know growing the company in a few different directions. Um, we're always coming up with new uh, products, so book sets that we're working on. Um, so you know people can come to juniperbooks.com and. and check those out. Um, there's, we try to have something for, for almost everybody that loves books or gifts for people that, you know, are interested in anything. Like a lot of what we do is not just for people that love classic literature. It's like, you know, cookbooks are beautiful and art books and travel books. So books about skiing or mountaineering, like we have something kind of for everybody. Um, so yeah, so we're growing a lot in that, that direction. Um, and, you know, I think there'll be some more exciting things coming out in the future. And, and I'm hoping that we'll have some more projects that people can actually visit in person and kind of see what we do and how we celebrate the printed word and the, the beauty of the printed book throughout history. Lastly, on the topic of the 12 monotasks, what is a message you would want people to take away from the book for their day to day being? So. Yeah. So one message is, um, you know, you always have a choice in everything you do. You can either monotask with your full attention or you can multitask with partial attention. That choice is available to you in any task at any moment in any place. And so if you decide this is important, these people are important, what I'm doing, you know, is valuable. I'm going to monotask. Great. You have that choice. You can do it. So don't feel like you always have to rush around, you know, being scatterbrained or doing 12 things at once. Like 
you can do it. Everybody is capable of doing it. It's a feeling that's like not going to be recognizable for a lot of people these days. Um, because we're so used to habitually multitasking. So go easy on yourself, be patient, but it's definitely worth it to do it. This is a wonderful thing. You are saying something that is healthy for our society and very relevant for anyone who actually takes this on board because their next day, they'll look back at their previous day and say, wow, that was different than all my previous days because look at all these things I, or even a few, or just one thing that I did and I did it in full and I can be glad about this for a decade. It's a wonderful feature. Yeah. That's right. I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode of the show giving us some great insight from your recent book and also a description related to your creation, Juniper Books. We are glad to have had you on. Yeah, it was really fun. Enjoyed talking with you. Thanks. This is super duper and we are out. <laughs>